Welcome to the House of Truth. Today we're continuing our series on the patriarchs. Last time we talked about the seed of Abraham and showed how that really refers to four different things with, with a different aspect each one of them, but all of them, all of them in some regard come with that come with it fall into this. I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. And this includes the, the we found, we saw that this this that the Ishmael was called the seed of Abraham, and, that the, and it applied to him. We saw that Isaac, who had not yet been, who's not yet been born, as we're going along, but who's going to be born, is the seed of Abraham in a, in, a, in a special way. We saw that Messiah Yeshua is the seed of Abraham. That the whole that the, that's the point of the whole thing to be a blessing. To all to be a blessing to all the families of the earth to bring them to the knowledge of the of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And lastly, we saw that that believers are the seed of Abraham as well through Messiah, because 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 they're counted as a generation to him as his seed. Well, today we're today we're today we're gonna we're gonna pick up right right where we left off, and we're gonna talk about the sons of Abraham. At the sons of Abraham, and look at these two, at these at Isaac, at Isaac and Ishmael, and uh, see how they're alike, see how they're different, and this relationship between them, and of course, between, and of course, their relationship with Abraham and with God as well. And we begin in Genesis eighteen verses one through six. The Lord appeared to him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. When he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself towards the ground and said, My Lord, now I have found favor in your sight. Now if I have found favor in your sight, pass not away, I pray you, from your servant. Have a little water, I pray you. Be fetched and wash your feet and rest your feet yourselves into the tree. And I'll fetch a morsel of bread and comfort you your hearts, and after you have passed on, for there for thereon, for therefore you come to your servant, and they said, Lo, they said, and they said, oh, I'm sorry, so, so do as you have said. And Abraham hastened to the tent of Sarah and said, Make ready quick quickly three measures of fine flour, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. Okay, so remember, Mamre is an Amorite. Has got displaced by those same kings that Abraham, that Abraham had, that Abraham had, went against to rescue Lot. And he's living in the land of Canaan, but he's not a Canaanite either. And uh, we don't know if he, you know, if they, if they, if they, got, if they, take possession of the land, bought the land, bought some of the land, or it was just empty and they moved in. We don't know. For whatever reason, Abraham's been aligned with him and is living in and living in his territory. Okay. Just you know, just just to remind you, and and he sees these three these three men stood by, and we'll go a little we'll go into more detail about these three men next week. But notice that one of them he, he refers to as my lord, and as we shall see, as we've seen before, as we seen before, as we showed last week, when it says when it, when it said the angel of the Lord Malach had an eye, that was a, a, that was a that was. A, pre, a pre-carnate manifestation of Yeshua, of Yahshua, Jesus, and the same is in in, in the same way said the word of the Lord came to him because the word of the Lord didn't start speaking to him, and the same thing, and we show and we show that was a case. Well, this we're going to show as you'll see this is the case here as well, that one of these is Yahshua. Remember, Yahshua said, Yeshua Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and was glad of it, and people understood him. That he meant Abraham had seen him. So, so he recognized these people, and he wants to show, he wants to show faith. He, he, he wants to spend time with them. And that's important. That's important for us to understand. We need to be will, We need to be looking for opportunities to spend time with the Lord as well. Now we continue on in Genesis eighteen, seven through twelve. And Abraham ran to the herd and fetched a calf, a calf tender and good, and gave it to a young man. He hastened to dress it. 
He took butter and milk and the calf that he had dressed and set it before them. He stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. So I'll certainly return to you according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah your wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard in the door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and strict, well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed at herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Okay, there's a there's several key points here. Several key points here. We need to first of all look how much trouble. Remember, remember, told Sarah to make bread, right? The pita. That's what he's if you like what we know of the day when he's referring to there when it's his bread. And now that but word butter could be also translated cheese if I remember correct, if I remember the if I remember the right correct the, the right Hebrew word. So basically he's making this he's he, he's making a little meat, he's making a little a little sandwich with milk and milk for these strangers. And look just how much trouble this is. Just 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 worth thought out. But notice also Abraham, remember, walks in God's statutes and commandments. And even and even though the law has not been written down yet, you know, we, we we've been able to show that a lot of these things that are in con, are in line with that. And he and he had and he's serving meat and milk dairy together. You know, there's nothing. The, the you know the the, the the rabbis have totally twisted what it says in there because it says do not cook a calf. I, I mean, I'm sorry. Do not, do not cook a, a baby goat in its own mother's milk. Well, he's not violating that here. It's not that milk's not from the calf's mother. Okay, that he's using here. But it's totally fine to have meat and dairy. Now, and the butter, of course, is also, is also dairy. Now, as we continue, as, as we continue on, let's notice. No, Sarah's in, Sarah. He's notice that Sarah's in the tent here, but she has she has moved. She has moved to the tent door. They're not actually, you know, they're not talking. They were going to, they were perhaps going to talk to her and tell her what they don't. Abraham's already knows this, but perhaps going to tell her themselves. But you know, this is the Lord. He knows she's prone to eavesdropping, so this is the way he, te- you know, he, he tells her. So she wanted to know what was going on. Now, this now these next parts are very important. They're not notice, but they're both old and well stricken in age. Abraham's one hundred. Remember, Sarah's ninety. It seems to be they're after the manner of women. Meaning she was no longer having her monthly cycle, so on and so forth. She has went through menopause. She was barren before. But there was always hope until now. I mean, now it's beyond hope, naturally speaking. She, you know, and notice this. That that, that before, before menopause, she had pleasure. And notice how she calls Abraham her Lord. And this is the first time she does this. First time we see her do this. She, Abraham, was, her name was Sarai. Contentious, remember. And, and she went to princess. Abraham's been calling her princess now. And not in a sarcastic way like, you know, you saw the original Star Wars where Han Solo is always calling Princess Leia princess in a very sarcastic manner. But, you know, in a very loving manner, and her attitude has changed. Her heart is, her heart is softening. She is, she, she, she's beginning, she's, in her heart, she's beginning to call him Lord. She's beginning to submit to him and act like a princess. And, 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 and again, notice what this, I want to bring, bring this up again, this having pleasure. This, she had pleasure in sexual intercourse with Abraham, not just Abraham, you know, prior to this. And, and there's two reasons why maybe she's not a pleasure. We'll look at them. One's, of course, her, but there's another reason as well, as, as I said. But this is what this is the way it should be. And if a woman is not having is not having pleasure as well, 
Something is wrong. She has a medical issue or or something like that. It's not things are not a okay. They're not, you know, they're they're not kosher at all. They're not copacetic. They're there is a there is a problem. And if and that's what's going on in a marriage, the man and his wife both need to take this seriously. Because it indicates a serious problem, perhaps in the relationship or perhaps in her body. But there is a serious problem if she's not experiencing pleasure, particularly before menopause. Now, let's continue on in Genesis 18, verses 13 through 19. And the Lord said to Abraham, Wherefore, wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Surely shall I bear, I shall... Shall I have a surety bear a child which am owed? Is anything too hard for the Lord? As I point, I return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. But he said, No, but you didn't laugh. And the, and the men rose up from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I shall do? He said, Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he that, that all his and I will and they will command his children and his household after they shall keep away the way of the Lord through justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which is spoken of him. So notice no, notice. The Lord said to Abraham, this one that's been talking to Abraham is the Lord, as I said. And remember, no man has seen the Father, according to Messiah, no man has seen the Father. And, and that's what, you know, when we look at we this fourth Moses, see his face, you know, and lived. So this is a free manifestation of Yeshua again. Talking to, you know, a, pre, a precarnate manifestation of Yeshua again, talking to him. And he knows our thoughts. He knew, remember Sarah laughed at herself, but, but he knew, and he knew she had done it. And we can try to deny our thoughts to the Lord, but there's no point. He knows our thoughts. He knows our habits, as I mentioned earlier. And there's no, and there's no, there's no point in ever arguing with him about anything. He's literally right all the time and literally knows everything. So now, now, now the next thing we need to know, the next thing of note here is that Abraham's going to be this reminder that Abraham's going to be a great and mighty notice a singular great and mighty nation. Remember he's father of many nations in that very mighty nation that all nations of the earth can be blessed in him to that nation. Remember, he's far many nations, as we said, and we'll show 22 nations come out, ethnic groups, remember nation means ethnic groups, come out of him. This great and mighty nation that through, through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed, it are the people are the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's it. so you know, there's that one and 21 others. But this is but but this great but that one's the great the, the great and mighty nation, and it's distinguished from the others because all nations of the earth will be blessed into him from it through it. And why why did he pick Abraham? Why as far as that goes, this great and mighty nation, as well. Why why is he chosen? Why are they chosen? Because. Because remember Abraham, we looked at it. it was, we looked at we looked, looked at we looked at the uh, the call, when we looked at the call of Abraham, the you know call, the call of Abraham. He 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 was called, and, it, and there were conditions, and they included walking in the ways of the Lord. And 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 the, and the, and, the, and, the, and we saw also that every single every single covenant he made, there were conditions. You know, like like last we looked, they had to get circumcised. There, there are simply this idea there's that the the, the 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 promised lands we give to the Jewish people, and there's no conditions, is simply nonsense. There's conditions. There's conditions for Abraham, 
and there's conditions upon them individually if they want to be part of the fulfillment of that. And, though, and, that's, and, and this is why Abraham was, was chosen. He was chosen so because so he was chosen to command because he would command his children his household after him, and, it, and that one day they would keep the way of the Lord, do just and judgment. Then the Lord could bring upon Abraham that which is chosen. And we show that the, cho- the chosen people were chosen to do to do something in particular, as we as we discussed as we discussed a while back in le- in the chosen in the chosen people. So. So that so that there is this condi- you know, there's this it's going to be fulfilled when the conditions are met. And this is and, it, and this is brought out here in Psalms 105, 42 through 45. And he remembered his holy promise that Abraham his servant. They brought forth people with joy and cho- is chosen with gladness, and gave them the lands of the heathen, they inherit the labor of the people, that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Praise you the Lord. All right, now this is referring to when, when, they, when this, 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 there's a back, this is a reference of, at this point right here. It's first of all, a, a past reference from our perspective, Abraham's in the future, but of when, of when they, of when the children of Israel came out of the wilderness, went to the promised land and, 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 and you know, they get in the lands of the heathen, the Canaanites, uh, they lived in cities they didn't build, and, you know, and, and ate from vineyards they hadn't planted. They inherit the labor, of the, you know, the the the, Can- the Canaanites, those people have done all this work, okay, but they inherited it. But for what purpose? They could observe his statutes, keep his laws, praise the Lord. But they didn't continue in doing that, as we looked at. We, we again, we talked about the chosen people. They were chosen. This is what they were chosen to do. So they could, so they, so they could show, make the ways of God known, make the ways of Yahweh, Yahuwah, however you like, known. To all the people of the earth, so they can all come. So they uh, can all come in the relationship with with him. And when they didn't do it, he God kicked them out. And it's part of the covenant we showed. But the day will come when they will do it. When they, when that renewed when as we discussed in the renewed covenant, when that renewed covenant comes, and that spirit of God's given to them, so they can keep his commandments. We read it literally says then he was able to so he can. Fulfill his promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that, you know, so it is conditional, but the conditions will be meet, met. And that's an important point here. God never lowers the standard down to our level. He raises us up to the level of the standard he set. So don't be looking to God to lower the standard. Be looking to him to raise you up to meet the standard. Now in Isaiah 51, 1 through 2, we can we get some more insight into this that this is not just about his natural descendants here. Hearken to me, you that follow after righteousness, that seek the Lord. Look into the rock where you are hewn, into the uh, to the hole of the pit from when from where you are di- where you are dug. Dug out, I could say. Look unto Abraham your father, and to Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased his father. Who is Abraham the father, and who is Sarah that bear you? Who is who is the mother? Who are they mother of? Those that follow after righteousness. This is not talking just. This is not talking about their natural descendants through 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 Ishmael. I mean through Isaac through Isaac. Because Ishmael Sarah, Ishmael that came from Hagar from Isaac. Okay, it's about those who follow after righteousness, and again. The believers, the children of truth, are those who follow after righteousness, those that seek the Lord. And we need to listen to him. You know, people sing that song, Father Abraham. Well, they could just as easily sing Mother Sarah, because Sarah is the mother of those of those who are in faith. And Peter brings and Peter brings us out in First Peter three through three, verses five through seven. For after this mayor in old time, the holy women also trusted in God ordained ordained them, ordain themselves, being subject to their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose servants, daughters you are, as long as you do well and be not afraid of any amazement. 
Likewise, you husbands, dwell with him according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel, and bring it and being heirs together in the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Okay, first, let's focus on Sarah first here for a minute. Sarah, I mean, she was rich, she could put whatever jewelry or whatever she wanted. But what really, but, but what really, her real adornment came when she started being in subjection to Abraham. Remember, she, remember, she wasn't really in subjection to him. She, you know, she was contentious. What's someone contentious do? You know, in, in a marriage, they're always talking back to their husband. It's a wife. They're always talking back to their husband. Always looking for a reason not to do what he asked, except you know, huh? You know, or or, or always come with a, a scheme like she, like Sarah did with Hagar. You know, and, and, and trying to and trying to push him into it. You know, or whatever, huh? You know, and, and manipulate him. But she became prince. When she became prince, she started obeying him, and that's what made him. And that was the real adornment that made her beautiful. And it's a and it's a and, it's, and notice, women, you are the daughters of of Sarah, just like men are the sons of Abraham. If you do what Sarah, if if you do what Sarah did, just like we men are, if we do what Abraham did. Remember, Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus, Yeshua said, "It's not that it's." The children of Abraham are those who do what he says. Well, the children of Sarah and Sarah should be the mother of us all, as we as we just saw. Do what do what Sarah did. So, but to make that a lot easier, the husbands Abraham being a great our great example has to dwell with them has to their part to make it a lot easier for the woman to obey him. A woman, a woman, a woman is going to have a hard time being in subjection to her husband. If he doesn't do, if he doesn't, if he doesn't dwell with her with knowledge, if he doesn't understand her needs and how to take care of them, if he isn't giving honor to her, if he isn't treating her as the weaker vessel that he has to protect, you know, kind of the ideal of the of the man being like a like the old brass spittoon, but the woman being like a mean dynasty vase, okay, you know, she's more fragile, easily broken, and needs protecting. You know, and her husband needs to be, and his, you know, so men, if you, you know, if you want your wives, if you want, if you want your wives to follow the example of Sarah, you need to step up to the plate and follow the example of Abraham and how, and how he treated her, particularly once started calling her princess instead of contentious. And, and, and what, and this is so, so important because this thing with this thing with this seed, with this, this Abraham, uh, 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 the son, the son, the son that was going, the son that was going to come through Sarah. Abraham couldn't do it by himself. He had to have Sarah on board. I mean, she had to be completely on board too. And we'll look at that. Okay, not just, not just, um, in, in not just in body and deed, but in mind and spirit as well. Because they together they were the they 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 they, 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 were, they were heirs to the grace of life, and it's the same for all of us. With our husband and wife are are heirs together to the grace of life. Otherwise, it, we have to be our our prayers will be hindered. Our prayers will be hindered, and um, because the truth is. You, you got to be on the same page when fear and faith are in the same household. You cannot help. You cannot help but to have conflict, confusion, or compromise. I mean, those are, one of those three is going to result from it. So you've got to get both of you in faith and out of fear. And then you have to treat. You have to treat. You have to treat your Sarah like Abraham treated his Sarah. So you're going to quit calling her contentious, start calling her princess. Now we're going to continue on in Genesis 20, verses 1 through 6. And Abraham sojourned from there from, from there to, towards the south country and dwelled in Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Sarah and Abraham said to Sarah's wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. And God came to, came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are but a dead man, for the woman which you have taken, she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and said, Lord, will you also slay a righteous nation? Say not to me, she is my sister. 
She even herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I've done this. And God said to him in a dream, yeah, I know that you've did this in the integrity of your heart, but I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, suffer not, suffered, I, suffered I you not to touch her. I did, not, I did not allow you to touch her. So, in other words. Okay, let's, so, look, so notice now, now he's he's heading towards the he's heading towards the south country. He's been up he's been up that area around Hebron, and now he's going further south. And and notice he got remember Shur's on the border of Egypt. Remember that's where that's where Hagar was headed towards before. Remember, and Kadesh, well Kadesh spoken about as being out in the in the area of the wilderness in other places. So Jerah. Gerard's just kind of right on the border, maybe just over the border of the land of the Canaanites. So Abraham once again has gotten outside has, has gotten outside of his calling. But not as far as this time he's just a little outside his calling, perhaps. And just like before, things he he does the same things happen. His wife is taken by the king. It's Pharaoh before, now it's Abimelech. Into the harem. His wife, you know, in, into the harem. Sir Abraham here. Abraham here as Abraham here has not not been um has been coward, you know, has been cowardly and deceitful, to be honest. And we'll look at that, we'll look at that in a little more detail in a moment. An innocent man. Who did this? Not because because he, he Abraham said she's available. He acted on it. Is it now in trouble? A curse has come upon them. Just in, has come upon them. And you know, in 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 God's in, in God and 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 they brought a curse upon themselves because they brought a curse to Abraham, even though they knew nothing about this. But Abraham knew. And notice Sarah went along with it again. They're having that same behavior they had before. And remember, so we talked last week about not getting over, not getting outside, not getting outside of your calling, you know, and how bring, how that'll bring you trouble and cause you things you otherwise wouldn't do. Well, this is, I mean, they're just barely outside their calling here. We're saying, I mean, we're saying Gerard is maybe just right over the border from the land of Canaan. You know, just right there at the edge. It should be okay, but it's not okay. Stay in your calling. Now, in Genesis 20, verses 18 through 13, we continue on. Therefore, Abimelech rose early in the morning and called the servants, told, told all these things to their ears, and the men were sore afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What have you done unto us? Of, and what have I offended you that you have brought me on my ki- in the only kingdom a great sin? These things you ought not to have done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest you that you done these things? And Abraham said, Because I thought, surely the fear of God not in this place, and they will slay of my wife's sake. And yet she is indeed my sister, she's the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And it came to pass that God caused me to wander from my fires. I said to her, This is your kindness which you have shown me from every place we shall come. Say of me, He is my brother. Hey, we see again the exact same pattern again here. Notice Abraham has made an assumption about these people. About these people and, and God Himself has said, Avmelech was totally innocent. That simply was not true. Now, what's true is the fear of God's perhaps not in the place. They're idol worshippers, you know. Um, you know, th- you know th- that may th- th- this perhaps is going to stop for Abu Malak after you know after this. But you know, the son, at least for him, maybe not for his, everyone, not as, all his people, but for him perhaps. But they're but but it makes an assumption about him, and how easy this and this assumption is totally unfounded. And it's based on his fear. His fear that, that, that people were kill him and take his wife. 
It wasn't true about Pharaoh. It isn't true about Ami Malak either. And how easy that it is to do with people who, who don't know God to automatically assume evil of them that may not be true at all. And, and, you know, there's absolutely no truth to his, no truth to his foundless accu, his foundless um, accusation, mental at least mental accusation against these people. Against them. there's just no truth to it. So you see, and notice how long this has been. And, and, and think about this: is, I mean, is Abraham walking in faith here? God has promised him first before, before he, before you're gonna have you're you're, 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 gonna, have, you're, you're gonna have a you're gonna have a seed of your you're gonna have, you're gonna have a son that, from your own body. And, he, and he's like, oh my gosh, they're gonna kill me and take my and take my wife. What part of having a having a child from his own body would that would include him being killed before that could happen? Well, here now he's promised one through not just him but through Sarah also. Which part? Which part is going is going? Which part of that includes him being killed and Sarah being taken? This guy's harem and this guy and this guy perhaps getting you know getting her pregnant. And I want you to notice things gone on the, on the life of, of Sarah here as well. They have seen that she. They, they have seen that she's beautiful. And we're, 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 we'll get a little bit more about that in a moment here. But that it's all been driven by this fear. And notice how long this fear has been going on. Ever since for 25 years, well, 24 years now. Isaac's going to be born when, Ishmael, when Abraham's 100. So, you know, we don't know where in 100. So 24, 20, for 24 more years, this has been going on. Actually, we do know that it's not. It's twenty four years and a few months here, frat, in a month or so maybe. So it's been going on for twenty four years. He's he's been he's been ha he's been perpetrating this deception, telling him, and, and and there's a little bit more to it as we're going to see. It's not just her saying so. There's actions as well to carry this out because she's he's not been living in fear, faith. He's been living in fear. Even though he's a father of faith, even though God, even though he has faith, his faith has been weak in this regard. Now, we continue on in Genesis 20, verses 14 through 18. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants. He gave them to Abraham and restored to him and restored Sarah's wife. And Abimelech said, Behold, the land, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. And unto Sarah, he said, Behold, I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to you a covering of the eyes to all that are with you, and to all that are with you, and with all others. Thus she was reproved. So Abraham praised, prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservant and their bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah. Abraham's wife. Okay, now first of all, I want you to, I want you to notice. I'm like then just say I'm sorry. He restores Abraham his wife. And and, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he kind of gives him some stuff for make, you know, make up for the trouble for the trouble, you know, the stress he's caused Abraham by taking her in the first place. Even though he's been totally innocent. But he but he can see that God, but, but God spoke to me and he wants you know, he wants to be on God's good side. So he wants to be on Abraham's good side. So he's, you know, given this. And note, and note for, well, this is important later, note the sheep and the oxen. Now, a lot of these men servants and maid servants, those men servants now are part of the, part of the house of Abraham. They're going to be circumcised. Now they also have been brought into covenant with God. Okay, so that, that they will also be brought into covenant with God as well. So some more of this accumulating the people of God, the the people, the people have not turned their back from God, or or going to know God, or coming to know God through Abraham, you know, primarily through Abraham. And we'll show this process doesn't complete for you know, take. It's going to take another four hundred years or so for that to complete. But it's primary. But most of them are, are, are being accumulated here with Abraham. Now we can, as we continue on, we we, we, we as we continue on, we see this. And note, and note, and he's really he's blessing Abraham. Once again, that blessing of Abraham. 
now, so so his repent is even though, even though he did it in ignorance, his repentance included restoring to Abraham, restoring to Abraham, and even blessing Abraham. And then notice what happened: God, Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech. Now, how did God keep Abimelech from touching Sarah? Abimelech wasn't Abimelech wasn't touching anyone. Abimelech, notice, then just the women, because remember they fast closed up, because remember Sarah was barren, and these women now his women became barren as well. Beca- you know, became barren as well. You know, when he was under this curse for bringing the, for touching Sarah, even though I mean for bringing her into the, taking them from Abraham, putting them in his harem, even though he did not know any better. But Abimelech was also healed. This is another reason why his wife wouldn't have any children. Why why he wouldn't have any children? Because, well, he wasn't because Abimelech was like was like Abraham here. His begetter wasn't begetting nobody. You know, and that definitely kept him from touching Sarah. He didn't, you know, he, didn't, he he just wasn't able to do it. So. So, so notice so this is super important to note for you to notice. If you're out there seeking God for healing, some super important things to notice. First of all, notice God does the healing. Abraham prayed, God healed. And I, I used to, there used to be a church where they, where I laid hand, where they, where they let me lay hands on the sick every week, and God healed many of them. And, and you know, including a man named Ron Givens, who, according to Ron's testimony. On my end, I felt nothing. I was just dead tired. But on his end, here's what he said. Fire came, felt like fire came out of your hands and burned every bit of the cancer out of my body. And indeed, his cancer was completely gone. I mean, next day, he had a doctor appointment scheduled. And there, you know, it was gone. But I didn't heal Ron Givens. God did. And this, you know, this particular church was the Church of the Nazarene. You know, they officially believed in healing. They, they, you know, on paper they believed in it, but but the way they acted, they didn't. You know, and the, and the superintendent asked after this, and said, if I could show him the Bible, then you know he'd let me do it. And I showed him this right here. I'm not healing anyone. God is. Abraham didn't heal Abimelech. God did. Prayed is a Oh, you know, King James, you know, King, even though we still use it today, the King, in King James time meant ask, beg, you know. That's all we can do is ask and beg. Well, not everyone that healed, that, that I played hands on got healed. And why not? Because they had unrepentant sin in their hand, in their, in their life. Notice, repentance isn't just saying, I'm sorry. And, and if you've done something wrong to somebody else, you need to make restitution. That's what Abimelech did. Abimelech made restitution. And by the way, Abimelech means Abi, my father, Malach king. Abimelech means my, means my father king, you know, kind of like God is our father king. And we, you know, setting the example here, we too, you know, some of you are like, well, I, I, I tried that healing. I tried asking God for healing and I didn't get healed and blah, blah, blah. And that's something. No, you. Pr- have you repented of everything? Have you? And has your repentance went beyond your words? Has it went to deeds? Has it cost you something, like it did Abimelech? Have you restored? The, have you restored that which you've taken from others, or done the best you can to make restitution and came into reconciliation with them? I mean, Abraham here. I mean, behold, my land is before, before you dwell where you pleases. He is in a relationship with Abraham here. I mean, that's, you know, you know, the, the relationship was wrong. And now it's been made right. OK, he, he's a friend to Abraham at this point. Have you done that? And if you haven't, that's probably why you're not been healed. Now, what else? What else is here? This cutting rebuke, you know, people read this may not understand. Don't, don't understand the culture and everything. You understand what a cutting rebuke this is, first to Abraham and then to Sarah. The rebuke to Abraham is what? He gave him a thousand pieces of silver to buy a veil. A veil, they could buy a good one for a thousand for a for a piece of silver. 
maybe a really expensive, fancy one for five ten. I mean, this is total overkill to buy a veil for Sarah. You know, and Sarah and Abraham's went on about how God's made him rich and blah, blah, blah. And Abimelech is saying, look, if you're too poor to buy her veil, here's a bunch of money. Make sure you get her one. Abraham, and this is in public, you'll notice. Abraham, Abimelech, my father king, is humiliating Abraham in public to bring him to a place of humility. And not just Abraham, Sarah as well. No, she was reproved. She's humiliated. Because what she's been doing, and she's liked all this. Yeah, yeah, as we, as we saw, in her heart, she's, she started changing her attitude. She, you know, is calling him Lord. But this going, this not wearing a veil is a, is a in the day, you wore a veil. Women that were married wore a veil to indicate they were married. Women that weren't a veil weren't married, didn't have a veil. She's saying she, you know, saying he's my brother, he's my brother, and that's all she's saying. And you know, and her father's dead. And she's saying, I'm this independent woman. I miss I'm a, I miss cosmopolitan American woman who nobody's gonna tell me what to do. Blah, blah, blah. And and you know, she has she has went along with this because she has enjoyed it. Okay. She doesn't like she don't want. She is more concerned with what other women think and might say, well, I can't believe he lets him push her around like that. And, she, you know, you know, and she, and she's just this doormat. You know, when she, whatever he says, she just does it. You know, she, she, she has listened to that and been obedient to the, and, and, and tried to please them instead of pleasing God. And she knows it. And this cover, and so this covering to the eyes Covering of the eyes, put this veil on and tell people you're not available is a cutting rebuke to her. She's being called out on her deception and her attitude. And notice that, that she got taken into the harem, as we said. God has restored her beauty. She wasn't in any condition to have children. She, you know, but, but he has restored her beauty. She was 90 years old, custom of women's past, except, you know, huh? You know, she, she was barren and wasn't functionally, we couldn't have pleasure, remember? All that has changed. God's been at work preparing her so she can conceive and have Isaac. But but this one thing has stood in the way. They've been they've they've had this fear living in the house with their faith. And it has caused confusion, compromise, confusion, conflict, and compromise. The fear has to go. And it did go. That took humiliation to, to, to get it to leave through a man called Abimelech, my my God, my father God, and my our father God will humili is willing to humiliate us too in public to get fear driven out of our lives so he can bring the blessing upon us that that, that requires that require that require that comes from having faith without fear. Now we continue on in Genesis 21 in verses 1 through 7 and we see what happens now that the fear is gone. Now that their attitudes have changed. What happens? Again, Genesis 21, verse, verse next chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. And the Lord visited Sarah as he said, and the Lord said to Sarah as he had spoken. For she conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born to him, whom Sarah had bare, bare unto him, Isaac. And, Sarah, and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when I, his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh to all that here will laugh, so that all that here will laugh with me. And she said, whom, shall I, whom would have said to Abraham that Sarah should have given ch children suck? For I am born to him a son in his old age. Okay, notice the Lord did what he said. He had now, just in case you're wondering, you know, I kind of I jumped from 18 to I jumped from 18 to 20. We will get back next week. We'll talk about we'll talk about Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot's children. 
So, I, you know, but today we're focused on the sons of Abraham. Just a way of a reminder here to you. I didn't forget. I didn't, I didn't forget something. I just, we're just, it's just a different lesson. I just want to clarify that before I continue on. But notice the Lord did what he said. He had to get the fear out first. It took humiliation, public humiliation, but he did it for their good. And now that Sarah has gotten to that place of submission to Abraham, not, 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 not in heart, in, in heart and in word, indeed. And it's quit being Miss American cosmopolitan woman. Nobody's going to tell her what to do. God has given her the desire of her heart. In Abraham, now that he's quit getting out, he's quit getting, he's quit go. He's, he's no longer, you'll never see him again go outside the boundaries of his calling. You'll never see him again act as a lie. lie this fear is gone. So the, so the lying and deception that comes with it is gone. The cowardice that comes with that fear is gone. You'll never see him again act like that. It's all gone. And God has given them what they what they desired because of it. And notice, and, no, and notice his name's Isaac. Isaac means laughter. Remember, remember Abraham laughed in faith because he thought it was so funny that God would wait till he was really old and everything, and then, then give him a child. Then give him this child through Sarah. Sarah laughed in disbelief as we saw earlier. So he's so he's laughter. But now, but now everyone's gonna everyone's gonna laugh. God has made her to laugh. She's laughing in faith like Abraham did. And everyone else is going to laugh because, because of the funniness of someone so old doing this. And notice, she's going to breastfeed this child. God has restored her not just not just not just her reproduction, her reproductive system, so she can so she can conceive. He's restored he's restored her top side too, so she can so she can feed the child. You know, she's not going to get a wet nurse or someone you know someone like that to do do that for her. He has restored her youth completely, and, and we're told he will renew our youth, like the, he'll renew the youth of us. Of us, there's conditions there, like everything. Go look up in Psalms yourself, but he'll renew the, our youth like that of an eagle, and that's what he's done here with Sarah, with Sarah, but Abraham as well as we shall see. And because notice Abraham's now a hundred years old, and we keep that. And notice Isaac here is being circumcised the eighth day. Ishmael was circumcised, but not on the eighth day. The eighth day is the right day. Abraham wasn't. Of, of, of Abraham's descendants, Ish, Isaac's the first to be circumcised on the eighth day, that day of new beginnings. You know, and that, that's marking him. That's that's all right. That's that, that, that's right there, marking him as different. You notice everything about about Isaac is different. We'll contrast that some more. The Ishmael's a lot of things are very different. We'll contrast that some more as we go along. But so Sarah's been totally restored, and let you know she's been renewed. And Abraham's, and and, and we're going to look here about Abraham himself because she wasn't the only one. She wasn't the only one with a problem here, as we shall see. In Romans four, verse sixteen through 20, twenty-one, we find the following: Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end of the promise, to the end, the promise might be made sure to all the seed. Not only that which is the law, but also that which is the, the faith of Abraham, who is father of us all. As is written, I made you a father of many nations. Before him, whom, whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those things that be not as though they were. Who hoped, who against hope believed in hope. They might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall your seed be. Being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. He was 100, about 100 years old, near yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform. Okay, so how so how did he do, how this happen? By faith, okay? And, and and again, if we walk in the faith, there we're the, we're the father of us all. He, you know, we're, we're the children of Abraham. And notice, it's God who quickens the dead and calls those things to be not as they they were. People have people have taken this out of context, and and even a plain says even God. They they 
they they say, see, we can call those things as though not they were. It's God that does that, not us. We, all we can do is agree with God and say his words, which is what Abraham did here. God, even though it looked hopeless, n- notice his own body now dead. Abraham's begetter wasn't get, begetting either, anything either. Just like a, it's like Abimelech, when, you know, when the, the same thing that happened to Sarah and Abraham was happening to Abimelech and his family. And his family, the rest, and, and, and Abraham restoring them opened the path for restoration for him and Sarah. You know, you, I mean, Jesus tells you to forgive people, Yahshua, Yeshua, however you like, for your benefit. He opened the path for him and Sarah's condition to be healed by, by forgiving and laying hands and asking God to heal heal those who had mistreated him even though it was really all his, his own fault and they did it in ignorance they didn't blame them try you know and try you know and try to make it th- you know them out to be the bad guy or anything like that he took responsibility and and he pled with god on their behalf and that uh, so the forgiveness he got is the forgiveness he reaped the healing he asked god for for Abimelech. For Abimelech and his and his wife is the healing Abraham and his wife received as well. He reaped what he sowed. It's why it's so important you treat others the way you want to be treated, not as they deserve. Or you think they deserve, perhaps in some cases. So Abraham's body, I mean, his beginner wasn't begetting anything. He was impotent, couldn't get it up, whatever you want to say. You know, he just, you know, he, 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 just, he just wasn't, he, just, he, he wasn't working as well. It wasn't just Sarah's, but he didn't stagger this through unbelief. Now, when was he not weak in faith? When he was out there in fear, lying I and mean, deceiving, acting in deceit, trying to solve the problem himself, saying, well, surely, you know, they're going to make a false accusation against people. And, you know, they're going to kill me and take my wife, you know, and, you know, and God's not going to be able to prom- do what he promised. No. He was, he, he had faith then. We're, we were told this already. But it, it, the faith began with, 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 I'll make you far many nations. He was told that. He had faith for 24 years, but he was letting fear live in the house also. Fear and faith were in the same household. He quit being weak in faith when he, quit being weak in faith when he got rid of the fear completely. That's when he was fully persuaded that God was going to be able to do what he performed. That's when he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. That's when he was strong in faith. Strong in faith. He was already giving God glory. So notice he had faith the whole time. But there's weak faith and there's strong faith. And it was a process. Abraham's case took 25 years almost. About 100. Okay. Almost 25 years. To go from, to go from weak faith a strong faith and it's a process in, 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 people, in people's lives today just because you may do something like abraham does doesn't mean you don't have any faith but your faith is not weak you are not fully persuaded and you're not going to be until like abraham fear is no longer allowed to live in your live with live next to faith in your in your house you've got to cast the faith the fear out so faith can have its way and, and God and, and God will bring about remember God's not going to lower his standard to meet to, to meet you he's going to ra- he's going to raise you up to meet the standard and it may take public humiliation like he did with Abraham and Sarah to do so but God will do it cuz he's got your long-term good in mind now now remember, I mentioned these the partners in this. Well, look, it's brought here in Hebrews eleven eleven. Through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful and prom- had promised. Notice, Sarah's the mother of all those who have faith. Sarah's the first woman, that, the first woman at least by you know by name, we're spoken of as having faith. The only faith Eve showed was that she, when she you know she named Cain and, and named Seth. Okay, she, but she wasn't really spoken of as having faith, but she obviously had some because when she named them, you know, that, that that's, that's, makes it evident. But 
Sarah is specifically spoken of as having faith. And no, she received strength to conceive seed. She had to get on the same page as Abraham. Abraham could have been totally in faith, no fear, fully persuaded by himself, and she would not have conceived. Men, you've got to take the time, listen to your wives, you know, listen, listen to your wives, you know, um, do whatever you got to do to move, move your wife in the faith with you, or you'll never accomplish the, 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 the accomplish in your life. God will never accomplish in your life what he wants to accomplish because you are, you, you're joined together as one and you can't, and, and and it cannot be one of you has is, is, is in faith without fear, and the other one has got fear as well. Sarah had to have the fear driven out of her too, and that in her case it was more it, it wasn't perhaps as much fear as that that rebellious attitude of of I'm miss you know kind of basically I'm Miss American cosmopolitan woman, and ain't no man gonna tell me what to do. That had to go, but when it did. She was totally in faith because faith will, because you can't be, you, you can't be in rebellion to God because if you're in rebellion to authorities over whatever authority God's placed over, you're in rebellion to God and submissive to God both at the same time. You know, and that was going back and forth with Sarah, but once it, once it was submission only, here, here it came. She, she now got, now, she now was, and how, and how could she be submissive like that? By faith. It take she had she had that faith in Abraham, you know, but she had that faith in God also that he was gonna take care of things. She, you know, she perhaps nagged at Abraham, why don't you give me each other? And blah, blah, blah. Abraham's like, Hey, I'm doing my best, honey. I've done my best, night after night, you know. What more do you want from me? You know, she quit looking to Abraham as her source, start looking to God. And women, you need to do that. Stop looking to your husband to, to fix problems only God can fix. And stop blaming him for things that are out of his control when he's doing the best he can. That's when you're receive. That's when you're receive strength. Faith's going to rise. You're going to receive strength to 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 get that to get that thing that God's promised you, but has yet but has yet to materialize. Okay, we're continue on Genesis twenty one, verses eight through twelve, and we're and we're. And we're going to see what happens. We're, we're going to see what happens next. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham had a great feast that same day, the same day that Isaac was weaned. And, ha- and Sarah saw the, Ish, the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman should not be heir of my son, even with Isaac. And I think it was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said to Abraham, let not be grievous in your sight because of the lad and because of the bond woman. And all Abraham has said, Sarah said to you, hearken your voice for an Isaac shall your seed be called. Okay. Several things need, need to be brought out here. Okay, Abraham. Okay, now, first of all, the child's, the child's group, but it doesn't give us us age here. And that's important to understand. We'll look at that. And when later we'll show his age, Okay. And some of these things will make a little more sense. And why Abraham's making such a big deal of this. He has a great feast. I mean, children get waned. People don't always have a feast. But he has a great feast. You know, the day has finally came. And notice he's, his feast is not, you, in, in your King James Bible, in your English Bible, you often see the word feast. And it's used it for different Hebrew words. This is not a feast like in Leviticus 23, the Moeds, the feast, the feast of the Lord, the appointed, literally appointed, the appointed, so that's what it means, appointed time of the Lord, the appointed time. This is a mishta, a celebration. And notice it's okay to have a celebration. There's, you know, you know, certainly we shouldn't include pagan customs and celebrations, you know, the customs that came from idolatry, but there's absolutely nothing. In the Bible, people say, well, in the Bible says have birthday celebration. Then the Bible says you can't either. Quit adding to God's word by, by making it like there is one. 
The Torah says you shall not take add or take away from his commandments. Quit making a commandment of your own like the Pharisees did in the days of Yeshua. You can have a celebration if you want one. You can even have a religious holiday if you want one. You just don't call it God's appointed time. It's not God. It's, a, it's called a Chag. A Chag Sameach. Hanukkah. Hanukkah being an example. Purim being an example. And we showed how Solomon made an extra week attached to the tabernacles to celebrate a religious holiday to celebrate to celebrate the the dedication of the temple and how God himself showed his pleasure with it by sending fire down from heaven to burn the sacrifice that, that, they, that Solomon set up and by filling the house with a Shekinah, the visible presence of the Holy Spirit, the glory of God. And the set in, in a holiday that in, in a holiday that that celebrates that, that gives honor to God, like Thanksgiving, is going to be pleasing in His sight if you're doing it for that reason. The only thing you need to do because Thanksgiving is just don't have a a, a cornucopia, a horn of plenty. That came from Greek idol worship, and the pilgrims, I assure you, did not have one on their table. That was added by people who who had classical educations, quote unquote, later. In my way, classical educations. Really is what studying is is a lot of it. It's a Roman Greco worldview, and it comes up. You know, it, it, it comes from saying Roman like in universities. You know what, what fraternities? They're called Greeks, right? They're called Greeks because you know they're that's it's saying it's learning Greek mythology, which is based from Greek idolatry, really. And these people, this classical education, drew that in on the pilgrim's table, but it never was there in real life, okay? But that's the only thing. So Thanksgiving's coming up. If you're going to, th- I mean, a, d- a national day to set, to set aside and thank God for everything we have is great if we actually do that and we know him. And I, so get, you know, do, again, do not, you know what it tells you otherwise is adding to God's word. They're adding their own commandments, the commandments of men. Get away from those people. Don't listen to the. Don't listen to them. Get away from them. They have no right to add their own commandments to God's. Now we continue. We continue on here. Notice Hagar is the Egyptian. Picked her up in Egypt. Remember, he went down to Egypt. He went down to Egypt and, and he got he got he, he got people added to his camp, brought them and brought them back up. Hagar was one of them. But there's a there's a problem here with it. There she's a now now she's a slave woman. She she was probably a slave in Egypt. I mean she's already a slave in Egypt. And they just you know transferred ownership to Abraham here. But notice that nonetheless this is her son. This is his son. But she but Sarah doesn't want him to have part of the inheritance. And notice God says, "Listen to your wife, men." I don't feel like my father, you know, basically, basically, you know, basically got had had several marriages and stuff and, and whatever, because he had this attitude, this would say it out loud, not just an attitude. That basically, women were stupid, didn't know anything, and men, you know, and you know, and men, and, and men knew everything, and you know, wouldn't listen to his wives, wouldn't listen to his wives. I think he, he finally learned eventually, but the hard way. Sometimes your wife is right. You need to not just automatically cast out what she says as ignorant or, or as wrong. You need to consult the Lord. God said to Abraham, God is the one who confirmed that Sarah was right in this case. And, 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 and there's a reason why she can't be, what, what, should not be, cannot be, like, like God doesn't want Ishmael to be an heir with Isaac. Because it goes back to that purpose we talked about earlier. There can't be any confusion who. We can't be confused about the line that, that ultimately results in Messiah. You know, you know, those who live in the land of Canaan are a particular group. 
and there can be confusion about who that, those people are. So God says separate them. You, and, and there's a little bit more depth to it, and we'll look at that in a moment. But you can't have the enslaved and the free mingled, just like you can't have fear and faith in the same household. You got to separate them out. You got you know, you got you got to get rid of that slave. That's everything from slavery, so you can live totally in freedom. But notice this: Ishmael is still Abraham's son. He's called his son. Ishmael didn't stop being his son. And notice, people say, well, he hadn't been cast out yet. Well, we'll see about that in a moment. But note, and notice, the, the, one more thing that's worth noting here, Ishmael is called a lad. And that's an accurate translation. And remember, we looked before, we we, looked, we showed before, we showed before when, when, it, when the uh, children of Israel told them to wander in the wilderness, 20 years old and up was considered an adult. So we know Ishmael is below nine, below 20 years old right here. We also know he's at least 14. I mean, I mean 16. He was at least four, he was 14 when Isaac was born. He was 13 when he circumcised. A year later, Isaac's born. He's 14. Now the child's weaned. It's got to be at least two years old. Ishmael's somewhere between 16 and 19 you know he's under 20 okay and we'll get down we'll, we'll, we'll nail this down exactly you know explain a lot okay but notice he's not a young you know ch a, a little young child like you see like like you may see in a in some illustrated bible or movie or something he is a teenager okay now we're going to continue on here and we're going to talk about this, why the separation is so necessary, because there's more to it than just the, there's more to it than just the literal separation going on. It's a picture of something greater. And that's what Shoal, the Apostle Paul is bringing out here in Galatians 4, 22 through 26. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by the bondmaid and the other by the free woman. But he was born the bond woman, was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. These things, which things are an allegory. For these two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which enters to bondage, is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and Arabia, enters Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage to the children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Okay, so several things I want you to notice here. First, first of all, I want to bring this very important point. Well, we'll start with a minor point first. Agar. No, it's not Hagar, Agar. In Greek, there's no H sound. That's why it's Hallelujah in Greek and it's Hallelujah. In the New Testament, it's Hallelujah in the Old Testament or the Tanakh. You know, the, the original covenant, as you like. Over in the Renewed Covenant or the or the New Testament, it's called the Brik Hadashah. It's called, it, it, it's, there's, it's, Hallelujah. Same thing. So don't get all hung up on that. It's the same person. So, so just remember that anytime you see that, that there's no H sound in Greek. There's no, they can't, I used to live in Greece. A lot of them can't even make the H sound. It's just too soft a sound for them. Their language is like the op Hawaiian has no hard sounds in it. In Greek, it sounds, I mean, it almost sounds like there's almost no soft sounds. And even the, the softer sounding layers like S have a little harshness to them. When the, the way they the way they say them, and so you say so, you know just think of perhaps some Star Trek you know Klingon or something okay, so there so you know kind of give you an ideal, so that's what's going on there. I want you to also notice when, before I get to the meat of this, Sinai is in Arabia. Where is Mount Sinai? Arabia, not where's Arabia? East of Israel. You know, east of the southern part of Israel, where's Sinai Peninsula, west of the uh, of the southern part of Israel. The Sinai Peninsula is misnamed. The Bible never calls that area the Sinai. Sinai means thorns, by the way. 
It's never called. It's never called that. It's in Arabia. In fact, in fact, there's, there's, a, there's a mountain in Arabia that the that the that the Saudis have that the Saudis have completely zoned off with a military guard. Well, there's not there's no military base there, and there's nothing the military value to protect. But, but the man went through there before they did that. They made a documentary. They didn't want other people seeing it, and and, and, and it's called El Laz. And, it, and it's it's granite top, and the granite top, and the granite top is completely burnt and charred. You know, and it takes like I, I forgot eight thousand degrees. I think it's eight thousand degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. Fire to, to burn granite. Okay, I, no, it's seven thousand. I think. But anyways, you know, I mean, how can the top of a mountain, not a volcanic mountain, it's granite, be charred? Well. Because because it, 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 everything about this fits this description, but it's in Arabia, and answers to Jerusalem, which now is the time of, of Paul, at, at the time at the time of Paul, the, you, you, or at the time this is written, you you had from the Mediterranean coast, you had Judea, Idumea to the east of it, Arabia to the east of it, and also went north up to the up. Remember, the king the the king of Arabia was the one that. Aretas, the king of Arabia, is who Paul escaped from Damascus in. Remember, so that, you know they kind of get they, they, there is parts. So don't think of the geographical political lines we have today when you're you know when you're reading this. But that Arabia is still Arabia today. Is my point here, okay? And to answer the it answer the Jerusalem because in that region, in in that region, even though the the administrative headquarters were over in a were over in Kessler Kessler. Caesarea, Marantina, or Se just Cas Caesarea if you prefer, Caesarea, over there on the coast. You know the the, the real seat of power for Jerusalem was Jerusalem, and everything east of it, the Romans just kind of had them, you know, go there to you know, so just went out that went from there out is what I'm trying to say. So, but there, so now we're getting to these contrasts. That's here, two sons. Well, just a small information for your own benefit. Two sons. First of all, notice it's an allegory. The, now, people look at these and say, you know, they all have on their mind either something's literal or it's figurative. But the Bible's answer is it's both. A thing can be both. Did Abraham really have two sons? Yes, Ishmael, who the Arabs came from. You know they got they've got well documented. You know, they've kept they've kept a very uh, they've had a high level of education compared to uh, relatively high for, throughout the centuries. At various times, less than others, but still, you know they've had some of the greatest centers of learning and stuff like Timon in, in in ancient times, and they kept records. And Ishmael, you know, they, and they say and they they say that the the descendants of Ishmael, Abraham through Ishmael. This other son, you know, Isaac, Abraham, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the people of Israel are descendants of Isaac. And again, well documented here in the Word of God, for one thing. They, the, the literal, they, they were literal, but it's also allegorical. The figurative does not do away with the literal, and the literal does not do away with the figurative. It's not either or, it's often both. So it's not that this that, that that Sarah and Hagar were just made up people, you know, to make this allegory, you know, to illustrate a point. No, they really did. They really did exist. Now, they existed. This contrast existed for a reason. The contrast between being a slave and free. And notice that which is, but it, now there's a contrast to their sons. Their birth was by how, the flesh, natural means, the promise, supernatural. A natural born person versus a supernatural born person. Someone that's born again. And notice there's like there's there's two and it's and it speaks of two, this these these things speak of two these things speak of two covenants. One, the original covenant, the other one being the renewed covenant. Now, does that mean, as people have said, Right above there, it says we're not under the law, blah, blah, blah. You know, we're under the law, except. Does that mean, okay, we're free to go out and murder and rape and steal, commit adultery? 
And it was a backtrack. Go, well, no, no, I didn't mean that, brother. They don't know what they mean. <laughs> What's it talking about when under the law? We're under the condemnation of the law. Why? Because because remember the renewed covenant, the same commandments that were given that were given in the original. The difference is the original one, we're trying to keep it under the power of our own flesh. And we're and we fell and we're gonna fail miserably. The other one, we've been given the spirit of God so we can keep those commandments. You know, as it says in Ro as it says in Romans 8. The flesh ruled mind is not subject to God's commandments, nor can it be. It's not subject to the law, nor can it be. The law, the law here Paul's talking about is the come is the covenant to keep the commandments, not the commandments themselves. The commandments are never going to change. Now, the other point that people get tripped up on is they mean well, they say, Well, I, I didn't mean all the commandments, I just mean, you know, now what? You get to pick and choose which ones? Well. The truth is that not all commandments have applied to anyone, everyone to begin with. And I did a series, and I did a, and I, and I did a series on this, a short mini series on this about the customs of the law, a while back. It went into greater detail, but like the high priest alone was the only one who couldn't go to the funeral of his own parents. That commandment wasn't for everyone, and the commandments for clean and unclean food are only for are only for are only for those who are circumcised. Those circumcised dare to keep the whole law. We're told in Galatians. We're told in Galatians as well. Okay, so, so, so the commandments that apply to you, up, the commandments apply to you. You've got to keep them. You cannot keep them by the flesh. You got to keep them by the by, by by the spirit which came by this promise. That's Paul. That's Joel's point here. And lastly, those two Jerusalems, the Jerusalem which now is an earthly Jerusalem. That speaks again of what that earthly seed in a heavenly in a, in a, above. And in that, in that in, and notice, it's not just it's not just a guard it's in, it's, it's in bondage, but Jerusalem is too at this point to the Romans, okay, with their children. But the Jeru but the earth, the things that the people are attached to this earth who are stuck in this world. Who rely on, rely on their flesh are in bondage. It's those of us who have our eyes fixed on Jerusalem above, that city whose maker is God, that are free. Because that is mother of us all. And why is it called mother of us all? Because a woman is associated with a house with a house consistently through the Bible, and even 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 in the even in the layers for the, even in the layers for the word daughter. There's an attachment to. Uh, there's attachment to the house, and we're and, and, you know we're gonna all of us are, are gonna live or at least visit, at least go home occasionally to this new Jerusalem if we're if we're believers, and that's our real that's our real home, and home is where mother is. Okay, that's why he's referred to as mother of us all. Okay, we're gonna continue on in Galatians. Four verses twenty through thirty one, and look at some more about this allegory, and you know the impact that has on us. And now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. For as any was born after the flesh persecuted him, persecuted was born after the spirit. Even it is so; it is now. Nonetheless, what says the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman, her son. For the for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with son of the free woman. So then, children, we are not heir, we are not the children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We have to get the slave mentality out of us. Okay. Hagar didn't ask to marry Abraham. She didn't flirt with him or whatever you want to say. I mean, didn't, you know, didn't come on to him in some way, you know, didn't try to entice him. She had no say in the matter. Here, here's my handmaiden. She's now your now 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 she's gonna act as your wife to raise up seed to me. Take her. You know, Hagar had no had no had no say in the matter. And she still has got this this mind and she's got that that bond woman mindset when this occurred. But 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 Sarah had you know the opposite problem. She was a free woman, but she took it too far. She, you know, didn't want to submit to the authority of her life, you know, huh? But she was definitely free. She was never a slave to anyone. 
just a volunteer, just voluntarily submissive to Abraham by virtue of marriage. But wasn't born, you know, as a slave to someone, to someone out, you know, to someone that you know, is, which is in a family, which is not, but she's not born into the, she's not part of the family uh, through blood at all, you know, through a bloodline at all. And it's the same with us. We're not to act. We're not to. We're, the children of the flesh persecute those born of this after the spirit. All of God in Christ Jesus are going to be pers- are going to be persecuted by those who are don't, who don't know Him. And it doesn't mean. Remember back to Abimelech. Doesn't mean every single unbeliever is going to persec is out to persecute you. But some are okay. Abimelech did nothing wrong. But Ishmael persecuted persecuted Isaac verbally. And you're going to be persecuted verbally and perhaps physically and financially. Because every, even so as it is now, if you're, if you're born after the Spirit, if you're born again, those who are not, some of them are going to persecute you. But not all of them. So don't go making that assumption like Abraham did about every single person. But lastly, we we cannot go around living like we're like we're slaves. We're not the children of that slavery of sin no more. We're free from sin. He did, if you hear my words, you're my disciple. If you're my disciple, my son, let's see. If you hear if you're my disciple, you hear my words. And if you hear my words and put put them into practice, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's what Yeshua said. In, in, in a in John in Gospel of John ver, ver, in chapter eight, we are supposed to we are free. We and, and we cannot be go around living like we are slaves to sin no more. And just like we can't have faith, you know, we 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 can have faith and still have fear. We we're never get the blessing till we get the fear out. We if we we got to cast out that slave mentality as well. That being a child of being a child of a slave, look at ourselves. A child of a slave has to go. We only see ourselves as a child, as a, as a child, a child of freedom, a child of Abraham and Sarah, a child of God. Now we continue. We're going we, we continue on with Abraham and Sarah. We, with our narrative here. And we're going to see what happens after she's cast out. I mean, the old said, well, see, see, that's it. Ishmael's been disinherited. You know, no, you know, Abraham has no son and Ishmael has no father. Well, let's just see what the Bible has to say about this. You know, the blessing of God's off Ishmael except. Let's just see what happens. In just 21, again, verse 13 through 16, as we continue. Also, the son of the bondwoman, I will make a nation because he is your seed. And Abraham rose up in the morning and took bread, a bottle of water, and gave it to Hagar, and putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child from under cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat her down over against a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and wept. Okay. Notice this. Remember, this is God speaking. He's going to make the son of the bondwoman, Ishmael, a nation, a, a nation because it's, because he is your seed. And remember, he had told he had told Hagar that before, but now Abraham as well. So Abraham is Abraham now has faith and no fear. He, he he casts her out. Notice rose up early in the morning, just gets it over with. Does, you know, no procrastination here. As God's given him a task and he and he gets to it, and he's taking care of this at the soonest practical moment. He can't wait. You know, he's not he sitting him out in the dark, but you know, as soon as it's daylight, gave him some food, gave him some water, puts it on his shoulder and the child and sent them away. No, didn't see anything else with them. No money, nothing. Just some food, just something to eat and drink. But he is trusting that God's going to do what he says. He's going to make him a nation. 
And why? Because he is the seed of Abraham. As I mentioned last week, Ishmael is still the seed of Abraham, just not the seed of promise. But he's a seed nonetheless, and the blessing of God's on him. And you better, if you curse, if you curse the Arabs, if you're in business, if someone's in, in business and they're out there used to not cheating people in deals, if they better not do that with the Arabs. Not because of fear of the Arabs, but because of fear of God. God will curse you. You better treat the you better treat the seed of Abraham through Ishmael. Right. If you don't treat other people right, you better treat them right. You better bless them. And don't make judgments about them and put them in a you know big rubber stamp. They're Arab, therefore, you know, therefore evil. You know. You you've got to treat them as individuals, just you know. I mean that was Abraham's mistake was prejudice. That's what it was, really. He's prejudging those people before he got to know them. It's easy to do because people are lazy. It's a lot easier than getting to know people and, and decide on a case by case basis. Just sort of clump them all together. But don't do it. He is the seed of Abraham. He didn't stop being the seed at this point. Notice God himself calls him your seed. Now, Abraham acted on faith. But what about her? She's. Not so much. She's ran out of water. No, he's called the child. Again, the lad, the child. And he's acting like a child. As I mentioned, he's somewhere between 16 and 19. We'll nail, the, we'll nail his age down in a little bit. You know, and he's crying to mama for water and she puts him down there and and no, remember, remember an angel of God appeared to her, the Malachi Adonai, Yeshua himself. She said, I seen God, I seen God and lived, you know, huh? Or God hears me. That's what Ishmael means. God heard me. She didn't say I saw someone live. She, but she said she heard it. God heard him. She talked to God. And now, which part of I talked to God and God and God and God promised her to make him a nation? With you know, with, with print, the princes would come out of and kings and so on. So, which part of that involves him dying before he's even married? None of it. But the truth is, she learned this behavior from Abraham. She is doing exactly what Abraham did in Egypt when when when, when, he, when, he, when, he, when he when he picked her up and brought her into his camp. He is. She is doing what she saw Abraham do, with, do in Gerar with Abimelech. She has that same kind of fear. Fear is contagious. And she's forgotten the promise of God. So that's the thing. When you're in fear, you may get out of it, but you're, that, may, that well, will get your children out of it if you've been, if you've been raising them. And remember, she's been, mar she's been married to Abraham for a long time now. A year before, she, before Ishmael. For you know, for, for for seventeen to twenty years, we'll look at that in a moment. You know, and get an ideal. And she has learned some things from. She's learned some bad habits from him, and this is one of them. She's learned some good habits too, though. We're about to see here, in Genesis twenty one twenty one. We continue on verse seventeen through twenty one. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, up to the lad and hold him in your hand. I'll make him a great, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the buy of water and gave the lad the drink, gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad, and he knew and dwelt in, in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. And his mother took him, took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. God heard her. The angel of God, notice this time, he doesn't come down. The, heard the voice of the lad. Remember, Ishmael means 
God hears. He heard him again. You know, Ishmael has had an experience with has had ex, some experience with God, the living God. And it starts off well in this regard. He's learned from Abraham as they've learned this from Abraham as well. And she's learned. And she's learned some things from Abraham that are positive as well. And notice, fear not. She has that fear that Abraham has taught has shown her. But she has more than just a fear. She has that slave mentality still. She's not she was perhaps born a slave. She's certainly a slave when Abraham picked her up, picked, you know, picked picked her up out of Egypt. And what's a slave to a slave looks to its master for provision. But a free person has to has to find provision for themselves. And God had already notice God didn't drain, dig a well, cause water to spring out of the wall, you know, you know, cause an artesian spring to spring up or something. The well was already there. Now, the the uh, in the Middle East, often people will hide a well. You know, will we'll hide a will we'll hide a well because they don't want to get there and it be empty. You know, someone else drank all the water out of it or whatever. You know, you know, because sometimes, uh, sometimes it takes a while for the refill. You know, don't want, you know don't want the well being going dry and then they have to wait on the whatever to get their desperate need of water. But. But she, but the well, provision of God was always there. Fear kept her from seeing it, but also so did the slave mentality she had. Now the food's going to run out too. But notice that, remember, he was a bow shot away. Now he's going to become an archer. He's going to become an archer and start providing. And notice what a wimp this guy was. He's 16 to 19 years old, I'll remind you again. If at that, at that age, I've been telling my mom, hey, it's going to be okay, mom. Sit under this tree. I'm going to go find us some water or, you know, or, or something. I wouldn't have been crying to my mama, crying for her. And he's, so we can see he's been a pathetic mama's boy. He's relied on mom and dad for everything. And never really relied on, never, you know, never, and has, and has got some slave mentality as well. But the wilderness is where God turns wimps into warriors. And that is what is going on here. And lastly, I, I mean, this is, he's in Paran, play of hunting. He's a wild man, remember? God, the angel had said that. Malach had and I had said that he'd be a wild man. He likes this lifestyle of living in the wilderness and hunting. And Arabs are known for their hunting to this day, for their hunting prowess. They enjoy hunting. This area actually really suits him. But finally, there's this problem. He gets his wife, his mother gets him a wife out of where? Egypt. Remember, Egypt's where she tried to run to. Egypt's what she's what she grew. She, Abraham took her out of Egypt, he couldn't get the Egypt out of her. And what's going on in Egypt? Idol worship. Now, so now the worship of God is going to be mixed in with things from idolatry. And it's that way today. Without dispute, archaeology has proven that many things are in the Quran and in, 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 in the Quran and in and in um Ishmael, I say, I, I say Ishmael. Ishmael cannot, I mean, oh gosh, Islam, so I'm trying to say, in Islam, in Islam today, cannot be taken care of. I mean, I mean, come from idolatry, I've come from, I've come from idolatry, like the crescent symbol, the moon goddess. Well, this is where that all began. And also, Notice this tie to Egypt between Ishmael and his descendants and Egypt and their descendants. You know, in, in the in the Muslim world, it, in the Muslim world, Ishmael is the top dog. I mean, Arabs in general, like except for the except for the, the Persians want to be, so there's that Persian camp as well. 
But, you know, like I have a friend, he's from India, his father-in-law, you know, his his father-in-law was kind of against him marrying his daughter because he wanted his daughter to marry someone with Arab descent. But I said, I looked at him and said, to me, it was obvious. You, you're you're a quarter Arab. What's the problem? And he looked and he you know looked into it. And it was true, and he got married, and he because his father law held held them as better, and, and but but the Arabs hold the Egyptians in high regard too, and they're in tight bond with each other to this day. And part and, and look at it. Ishmael's mom mother was was an Egyptian, and so was his wife. You know, genetically, they're one quarter from Arab, from Abraham, three quarters from the Egyptians. Okay. You know, so the, so the Egyptian, the, the Egyptianized cousins of the Jews. But that, none of that, so, so now he's been cast out. And if there's any doubt in your mind, he's still the son of Abraham. First Chronicles 1, 8, 28 should, should get that doubt completely out of your mind. The sons of Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac and Ishmael are the sons of Abraham. Period. It never changed. Abraham, when, when, when he was cast out from the inheritance, the inheritance of what? Of the land of Canaan. Primarily, that's what it's talking about. When he's cast out of the inheritance, not going to have the promised land split, uh, can only go to this one, can only go to one, the seed of Abraham, singular. He didn't stop being the son of Abraham. He didn't stop being the seed of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham did not leave him. Did not leave him the part that you know so much applied to him to begin with. Ishmael is still the son of Abraham as much as Isaac, and so are their and so is his descendants as much the descendants of Isaac. Now we're going to continue on in Joshua twenty four three. I took. There's, there is a difference. We're going to look at that here in Joshua 24, verse 3. And I took your father Abram the other side of the flood, led him through the land, all the land of Canaan, and multiply his seed, and gave him Isaac. Well, look, in one sense, God gives all of us children. You know, he'll say he closed up the wound, he opened the womb, so and so. He's in control of that, you know, to some degree. We got to do our plant part. We got, we got to plant the seed that he makes it grow or not, okay? And multiply his seed. Notice, more than one. More than one, but only gave him Isaac. Only gave him how? By supernatural means. He gave Isaac in a, through promise. He gave Isaac in a, in a way they did not give Abraham any other, any other children. Through a supernatural means. Ishmael came through a natural means. And, and we'll see, and there's going to be more later. But Isaac alone was given directly by God through a supernatural birth. So I so that makes I, 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 so a, Isaac is a is a son of Abraham in a special way that Ishmael isn't, but they're still both the son of Abraham. Now we continue on. Now we're gonna get to this question about how old were how old were these how old was Isaac and Ishmael when all this happened? And we're gonna look we're we're, the, we're gonna look, we're gonna do a little math and it'll become apparent to us, and also. Clear up some misconceptions along the way. Acts 7, verse 20, verse 6 through 8. And God spoke on this wise. They siege the sojourn in a strange land. And they should bring them into bondage and then treat them evil 400 years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. After that, they shall come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the 12 patriarchs. Okay, first of all, what's, what's the 40 years include, incur? A period of sojourning in a strong land and being in bondage. And being treated evil for 400 years. Now, people have looked at that and say, well, that, so they said they spent 400 years in Egypt. That is not what it's saying. Remember, Abraham did not own so much. Did not, he didn't even own a place to bury his dead. He just wandered from place to place around the promised land we looked at earlier. Remember, he's from Ur of the Chaldeans. This is a strange land to him. And his seed didn't own anything either. 
Except except for except for one place to bury their dead. We'll talk we'll talk about that later in another lesson. And then bonds together it's 400 years. And when does 400 years begin? When Isaac was confirmed as the seed, which we'll see in, in, in a couple of lessons down the road. Which is right after the, all these things we're looking at. Okay, by the way, all right. So when Abraham's so when Abraham's a hundred, so when Abraham's a hundred, it's going to be forty years. They're going to be in Egypt. And now remember, in Exodus, I believe it's, I believe it's Exodus thirteen one, but it might it might be the end. Of, it is thirteen. It says the same self day that as Abraham was given this promise, they left Egypt. And that's Aviv, okay? Okay, it's Aviv on, on, on the day of the day, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 15th day of Aviv. It says the same self day is 400 years. That means the 400 years couldn't have been just the time they were in Egypt. And, to rem and if you got any question, any doubt about that, besides what I've already given you, you can go look that up yourself. You can also see it here in Galatians. 3 verses 16 through 18. Now that Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not to seeds as many, but as of one, and to your seed, which is Christ. In this I say that the covenant which was confirmed before God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, should take the pro it should, it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it should be no more promised, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Okay, notice, this, notice this, 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 that original promise. When Abraham first came in the land, he's 75 years old. 100 minus 75, when, when, when this thing with, with this business we're looking at occurs, is 25. 400 minus 30, 430 minus 400, is 30, 30 minus 25 is 5. And, and we can be certain of this, that that's 430 years is, is, is from what? Is when the law was given, that covenant, the law, at Mount Sinai, it was given the third month of that same year as they left, that they left Egypt. They left in the first month, it's given the third month, okay? Around the time of Shavuot or Pentecost. So, so, that promise was made 430 years before that. Now, Abraham wasn't in the, in the promise land 30 years, and his children were in, the, in Egypt 400 years in slavery. The whole thing's 430. And, and if, you, if you map all this out, you'll find they were in slavery, slavery when the Pharaoh rose after Joseph died until Moses delivered them was, four, was 215 years, exactly half the time. Half the time they spent wandering in a land that wasn't their own, Canaan, half the time in Egypt, when they went to Egypt, they wasn't, still wasn't their own. So Canaan, then, then Egypt, and half the time they were slaves. Okay, and together it's 400 years from that point. And, but for the 430 years, it's, it's exactly half of it each place. Again, you can, you, can, you, can, you can go read, do the math yourself, and you'll find this to be true. So Ishmael and Isaac, Isaac is five years old when he's weaned. I mean, Abraham's relieved. No wonder he's throwing a great party. He thought the day would never come. And this is why, you know, this and, and this why this is why Ishmael's making fun of him for being, you know, basically a thanks mama's boy, which Ishmael himself was also, as we saw. Ishmael, that means Ishmael's 19 years old when he's cast out. This 19 year old. I mean, there's people, in the, there's people, 19 year old, who are in the military, who are who are, who are fighting in war. But Ishmael's not a warrior at this point; he's a wimp. The word of this is where warriors or wimps are turned into warriors. And this, and this pathetic mama's boy out there, 19 years old, crying under a bush. Mom, I'm I'm thirsty. <laughs> Breaking his mother's heart instead of taking action to take care of his mother and comfort her. So both of them, 
And we'll see some more evidence to this of Isaac as we go along. Our both pathetic mo mama boys. And again, I'm not saying this. The Bible's bearing this out. Now, we're going to wrap up by, we're going to consider, by wrapping up, we're going to wrap up by, by, by we're going to finish up with the, with the relationship, as I mentioned before, between Abimelech and Abraham. You know, and how, you know, you know how Abimelech acted in faith to some degree. It's all the blessing God God and wanted. You know, it, it, it made friends with Abraham. And, you know, and what the result of that is. Remember, Abraham's in his land. He's, he's, he's in the land of Abimelech, wherever he wants to be during this whole time. And let's, the problem crops up. And let's read it and see what happens. And they came to pass that time that Abimelech and Philco, the chief captain of his host, spoke unto, uh, spoken to Abraham saying, God is with you as you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me by God that thou will not deal falsely with me, nor my son or my son's son, but according to the kindness and I've that I've done to you, you shall do unto me into the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water that Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. And Abimelech said, I know not, I know not who has done this thing. Neither did you tell me, neither I heard of it yet, yet heard of it until today. Now, first thing, first thing, notice he bring, notice he brings the chief of the captain is, 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 is major is, is general with him. It's not to threaten Abraham, but to assure him of protection. Okay. He's letting him know the military is on, on, on this side on Abraham's side as well to protect him. Okay, it's nothing to fear. The military is there to help him, not to harm, not to harass him. And notice this: you're, me, your, your son, and my son's son. Well, Abraham said so that'd be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so they make this covenant. He wants to come to this, come to this covenant with him. And remember, he's remember he's walking according to the commandments. Well, the commandments then said, said no making covenants with the inhabitants of the land, but listen to the Canaanites. But I'm like, it's not a Canaanite. Okay. But there's a problem. Abraham's willing to do this, but there's a problem. Abimelech turns finally took away a well Abraham dug. Now Abraham reproves Abimelech. Say you're meant, you know. But Abimelech once again is innocent of the whole matter. But he wants to make things right, as we shall see. Now. We see a a a chain a flip from what we saw earlier when this occurs. Genesis 21, 27 to 31. Verse, verse 27 to 31. Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flocks by themselves. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs which have set by themselves? He said, For these seven ewe lambs you shall take of my hand, they may be witness to me that I have digged this well. Therefore, he called that place Beersheba because they swear both of them. Now, people, I've had people like when I grew up like, say bears in the Bible. There it is, Beersheba, the place of beer. No, it's Beer, means well. <laughs> Sheba, seven, the well of seven. Just want to clarify that in case you think this is some sort of endorsement for Budweiser or something. So, you know, so. What? So what? So so so. Notice this time. Remember the sheep and oxen I told you earlier. Remember that. Now notice Abraham's the one doing the giving. Abraham has wronged Abimelech by making these assumptions, but now Abraham has humility. He realized. He he, he rebuked. You know, he, he reproved Abimelech for it. Accused him really. And Abimelech was innocent. Abraham's now doing this in the show. He's sorry. The same thing that Abimelech gave him earlier in the show. He was sorry, even though he was in total innocence. Abraham's giving him what he's not giving to him is the children, is, is any people. Because they've now been circumcised, and there's, you know, there's kind of no going back, okay? And they make this covenant. 
And as I said, we'll show he's not making a covenant. And remember, Gerar, Gerar is kind of there on the edge of the job. It's right there at the edge of the Gaza Strip. I mean, I mean, sorry, the, the Sinai Peninsula. You know, barely over the border. No, he's not in Gerar this time. He's in Beersheba. So, you know, Obama, Ab Abimelech's um, territory has expanded since Abraham's been wa walking the land. You know, God's been giving him favor. And Abimelech has recognized that and won't, you know, won't, won't covet it. So, I mean, Beersheba's, you know, from Dan to Beersheba, it's kind of the main part of the, of, of the promised land frequently during the time of David and yeah. that. So, you know, so, so, you know, we're down that southernmost part of the fertile. That's where the fertility kind of ends and desert begins is Beersheba. And, and so that's where they're at. They're not down there. And Abraham is no longer leaving, getting outside of where he's called, uh, out, outside of his calling. So he gives them the, notice they're ewe lambs. What's that ewe lamb speak of? Female lambs, young females, for, you know, you know, Gonna grow up and be and and and, and gonna and gonna reproduce, you know, and reminding Abimelech of his, of the barrenness of his wife, of his wife and his maid servants, and, and when Abraham prayed for him, remember the women were barren. Remember the now he's been given he's been given women female sheep, okay, to remind him. And again, that points him back to God. Abimelech remembers God, Abraham prayed to, to the God of Abraham. And he was healed as well as the women. And so now Abraham, if you want to say bought this, you can say that. But, he, but remember, he told him, go wherever he wants. Well, th this is a witness that he dug that well. So that well is Abraham's, no one else's. He may not own any land, but he does own a well now. You know, recognized. So, and and the and the general there is there, and the general there is to hear it. He's going to he's going to defend the border and protect that well because he's there. That's what he's there for. That's why he got brought along for to show. You know, that's why he's part of this. We wrap up here in Genesis twenty one thirty two through thirty four. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech rose and. And the, the chief, the chief captain of his host, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned, sojourned in the Philistines' land many, many days. Okay, where's this Philistines' land today? Gaza Strip, okay? And you might say, well, wait, now didn't. He, if he's in the Philistines' land, didn't he go outside the land of Canaan? Wasn't he now out of his out, 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 out of the place of his calling? And the answer is no, and I'm gonna explain why. It, it comes from understanding who the Philistines were. Now you may you may have heard they were sea sea people who came down from Crete or Cyprus or something like that, you know, and and settled down along the coast along the coast. What you know. From Ashkelon down along the coast there of what's a uh, little you know, part part of Israel in, in the Gaza Strip, but the Bible tells a different story, and archaeology has bear, has bore it out. Remember when we talked about the sons of Noah a while back? We looked at them. Out of Mitzarim, the Egyptians came Kaptarim, another ethnic group, and you know, and and, and they settled in Kaptor. And that's where archaeologists have found. If you kind of draw a line going north and south, straight up from the from the two tongues of the Red Sea, uh, on both sides of, uh, Mount, uh, of the Sinai Peninsula, and then kind of go halfway between those two points on the Mediterranean coast, you will find Camptor. And then they went from Camptor and invaded. They were invaders. Some of them went out of Camptor and were invaders into the land of Canaan because you know the Sinai Peninsula's got some nice beachfront property on all sides but the middle I mean there's you know there's not much there for there's the land's not fertile at all but the land of Canaan remember was fertile and they were in the word Philistine literally means invader and historically what happened was was, was a group of these discontents 
try to over try to overthrow the government of you know the pharaoh the government of egypt they ran you know they ran off to the they ran from the desert you know in in, in a, creating camp tour the camp tour the camp tour reams did this ethnic group they tried you know you know then they saw then they saw this good land and invaded and also you know and also wanted to be a little further away from the egyptians the, now philistine is the same as Palestinian. You can look it up in the dictionary. The Roman the Palestine was named after them. When the Jews, when the Jews revolted re, in the Great Revolt, and they were cast out, and, and Jerusalem was destroyed, and the temple level as Messiah had said it would be, they renamed it Areola Capilina. Didn't last very long. It wasn't very catchy and whatever. And, but they, but but later. He's five years later, the rest of what Mishusin came to pass in the Kokbar revolt, and the Romans cast him out of the land in the Roman dispersion that's going on, diaspora, which is going on to this day. Okay. And to add insult, and just let the a remnant was left there, you know, was left there. And they were allowed to go to the well, the, the, the Western Wall, which was called the Welling Wall to recently, to mourn their loss. Because the Romans just liked watching them well and gloating over them, over it, okay. But the land was renamed Palestine from the Latin word for Philistine. After these people here, after these invaders, it literally means invaders. And history has repeated itself again. The fact is, there never was some country named Palestine, other than other than the land of Palestine we're reading about here. But it, it, since the time of the Romans, let's say there was never a country called Palestine. Remember, it was a it was a Roman province, okay. And afterwards, various empires took it over. The name stuck, but there was no country, independent country called that. There were no people called Palestinians living there. Palestinians had to be there, whether they were Greeks or Romans or Arabs or whoever. And it went back and forth. And the last people who got it got control of it before the Brits. Finally, the Ottoman Turks got control of it. It got control of it in 517. Or 1517, I'm sorry, 1517. And they controlled it for 40 day, 40 years actually to the day in 1917. And they, the owners of the land, actually lived in what's Turkey today. The people they brought in, they brought in workers to be like sharecroppers called fellas. Who worked the land, but they didn't own the land. They were just tenant farmers. When World War II ended, the treaty in the, in the Treaty of Versailles and 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 the Ottoman Turks had to make war preparations as part of the repayment. What they called Syria, which included all of all of today Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, and you know, part, and perhaps parts of Iraq as well, Iraq as well. You know, and maybe even further over they. They had to get. They gave the northern part to France as part of the repayment, and the southern part to, to the British. The British issued the Balfour Declaration, giving their entire part of that to the Jews. They later reneged on it and started chopping it up and making Trans Jordan, which became Jordan. And every time they chop, every time they got, they took away part of the of what the land they promised the Jews. They lost part of their empire. And by the time they were done. By the time they were done chopping it up, all they had left of the, of the British Empire was, well, Great Britain and the Falkland Islands. You know, the sun, the, when they started, their empire literally wrapped the earth. The sun never set on it. But, but by, the time they, by the time they were done giving away the, the, land, the land they promised the Jews, the sun had set on their empire. So, so, that, so those are these, so these are these Palestinians. Then, then, but the Turks still owed money in the Treaty of Versailles. And the Rothschilds, Jew, rich Jewish families, you know, made their money in banking, except for centuries, gave them $1 billion for the, for, for the land they had, already, they, they had already given to the British and the British already given to the Jews in, in, in the southern part of what they formerly called Syria, which included all of Israel today. Uh, and that was be like two hundred fifty billion dollars in today's money, by the way. Okay, just an, an, you know a huge amount of money. The people who, who were on there farming it still didn't own it. The Jewish immigrants who came in, nonetheless, paid them for it, 
and they sold it. They gladly took the money because it wasn't their land anyways. It was free money as far as they were concerned. So the Palestinians are invaders. So the land of the Palestinians, this land of these invaders, is the land of Canaan they've invaded. And so they've never so they never were so they so they never really had a had a right to it at all. It, you know, when, it, when the land was, when the, when the nations were divided according to the children of Israel, as we read, by God, these ethnic groups got these different pieces of land. They were never given this piece. So it was actually the land of Canaan, but they had invaded it, in which we see here in Beersheba now, way, you know, way, way off from the Gaza Strip today. So Abraham is still in the promised land, not the greater promised land, not just the greater promised land from the river of not from the Nile River to the Euphrates River we talked about. That includes for all of his descendants, but that promised land that's a promise to that seed of inheritance that the bondwoman could not, the son of the bondwoman could not inherit. He has not left his calling, and make sure you don't leave yours either. Even if there's invaders in your calling, in the, in the area of your calling. That's all I have for this week. Until next week, shalom.